Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, I thought I'd start you off today with a pretty uh, impressive satellite animation here. We're looking over in the western part of the United States. We've got yesterday, then we have the sunset here, so we're going into infrared imagery here overnight, and then the sunrise today. And what you can see here at the very end of this is the tremendous drop in air quality from the fires that have broken out in parts of California and across parts of the Rocky Mountains and other sections of the western United States. You can even see the heat signature in the overnight hours in the fires. I'll show them to you again here in a few moments. Watch as the sun sets and you can see all the blotches of, of dark uh, colors in there representing where the fires are putting out their heat signature. So it's this upper level ridge that we have to spend some time talking about at the beginning of this video because it's going to be the position and movement of that ridge with time that actually determines whether or not the system is fully blocked over the western U.S. or if things will start to break down and begin to move. So keeping that in mind, let's go straight from there to a quick look at the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. You can see the center of the ridge is sitting somewhere here in Utah in the ring of fire pattern that is very tightly compacted around it. Now you know we often talk about northwest flow coming across the Corn Belt producing uh, better chances of seeing storms, but that's when we have a bit more of an open wave in the western part of the United States. This one's tucked in very tightly and is, uh, is spinning in such a way that it is confining a lot of the convection uh, to the to the kind of the high plains rather than allowing it to spread into parts uh, of the Corn Belt, for example. We can also see the high moisture content of the air that's come into parts of California igniting some of those thunderstorms, and it's been due to those thunderstorms and their lightning that we've seen some of these fires uh, get ignited. So to show you midday today what that flow looks like, you can see how that ridge is really kind of lopped off from the main circulation. So there is the, the ridge, but the flow to the north of it here telling us where the jet stream winds are located is kind of running over the top and there's nothing really in the near term. So meaning over the next several days here that's going to push that particular ridge out or even flatten it up. And that would be something like a trough like this that could do it should that one start to dive much farther to the south and really push this ridge out of the way. But in the near term, it doesn't look like it's going to be doing that. So when we get over into the eastern part of the country, we do have relatively stagnant upper level flow in this area. And uh, so we're looking for these reasons to get something to move. And in the near term, it does not appear that any of those features are going to be present. So if we talk about precip not only over the last seven days, which is shown here, which has included some extremely heavy rainfall in parts of uh, North Dakota, getting into Minnesota and Wisconsin, also the thunderstorm complexes that moved out of Kansas and Oklahoma and Arkansas, and then the very heavy rainfall, which is going to continue to plague parts of the southeast to the mid-Atlantic. Uh, that's going to be kind of the, the, the name of the game moving forward here while we watch this ridge stay in place. So as we search out over the next week, you can see that here's the scattered thunderstorm activity around the ridge. Uh, and again, right along its periphery here, we could expect to see some of the storms become strong to severe. The upper level flow pattern in through this area, though, is not necessarily conducive to lift. And without having a big front sweep through this area, we overall see relatively drier conditions. Storm systems tend to run around the periphery here into parts of the Canadian prairies and also here into parts of eastern North Dakota, but getting into southern Manitoba and then over into to uh, parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. But as you can see to the south of it, relatively low chances of getting precipitation through a broad sector of the Corn Belt in this case. As you come over to the southeast, this persistence here of daily convective activity is kind of a, a byproduct of a few different things. We have no reason to shut down or to stifle the, the vertical motion in this part of the country. And given that the high pressure cell is still sitting out over the Atlantic, we're feeding this area with plenty of moisture. So what's going on here is the daily convective activity uh, seems to just continue to, to pop in that area and we're getting quite a bit of shower and thunderstorm activity. But the attention I think a lot of us are going to be paying, you know, close much more closely to is going to be what's coming out of the tropics because as you can see there conditions in parts of the Gulf of Mexico and along the southeast coast do look very very wet. This uh, particular forecast is shared very well by the National Weather Service which again is blending several models including the GFS and you can see that overall the picture here between the two models looks very similar this of course being the National Weather Service's uh, forecasts. So what's going on in the tropics? Well, we're still giving uh, the National Hurricane Center still giving what's in called Invest 98L, a 90% chance of developing. And over here, this would be the uh, second system that's in the Caribbean, uh, an 80% chance of developing. But we've watched some very interesting trends in the last couple of model runs. In fact, some of the 
deterministic models have been uh, failing to resolve tropical cyclones out of, especially out of the Invest 90, uh, 98L, and have allowed 97L to actually get here into the Gulf of Mexico at times. So let me show you what the latest thinking is on both of these systems. Now, rather than just showing you either the GFS or the European, this is a, a suite of several different forecast models, all predicting where the low pressure center will eventually go. And there's some evidence given the position of a high pressure cell that's sitting here that's moving around like this that we could push what is left of this open wave it's not yet a tropical cyclone remember this open wave toward the northern edge of the lesser antilles then going just north of like the island of Hispaniola and cuba and possibly getting over here to interact with part of the southeast coast or, or possibly florida maybe even to, into the gulf of mexico so big questions remain with this and i'll tell you the latest model run from the ecmdbf even failed to initialize a closed circulation with this system. Now, overall, that's tremendously good news given that we do not want to see the added pressure of the flooding rains from a system coming out of the tropics, nor do we want the damaging effects of, of storm surge uh, and, and, the, um, and the flooding that comes along with it and also the high winds. So overall, I like seeing that the models are backing off on this, uh, encountering some higher wind shear, uh, which is tending to kind of disrupt that particular system and closing off its own wave. Now, when we think about Invest 97L, that's the one that's in the Central Caribbean here. Uh, at this time of year, the Caribbean is not exactly the most friendly environment to get tropical cyclones to develop. And the models, once they get this cluster of storms over toward the Yucatan Peninsula, there's, like you see here, quite a bit of spread as to where the potential center of that wave could move. And if it should get into the Gulf of Mexico, will it continue to develop? So I, I hate to do this, but right now, predicting the paths of both of these tropical systems, there's more question marks than there are answers at this point. So we're going to continue just to watch to see how both uh, systems move and how the conditions around them could possibly allow for some strengthening. I will comment though that the conditions in the Gulf of Mexico and also in the eastern Atlantic, or excuse me, just off the east coast in the western Atlantic, those ocean temperatures are quite warm and very supportive for development should something get there. Now let's come back to this overall flow pattern. I'm going to take you out just five days from now. At that particular point, looking down here on the north pole, we do, we do still see our larger ridge over the southwest. But do you notice the trough that's pulling here off of the coast? You see, this particular setup, if you look at it in terms of wind speeds in the upper levels, is giving very zonal flow across the Canadian prairies getting over into eastern Canada. And there's just this ridge sitting underneath it that really is just getting tumbled over and over again and not really moving out of the way. But if I come back over to this image on the right, what I'm really looking for here is anything to block up the North Pacific. And I don't see it. You see a large kind of uh, deep but open trough here. And then even getting over toward Asia, you can still see that the jet stream there is resisting a look like a high or low pattern, a Rex block or an Omega block. Where I do see things getting kinked up a bit are, are way back on the opposite side of the world uh, to, to North America. And at this particular point, I'd have to question whether or not that could really influence the flow across the Pacific with time. So what I'm trying to build a case for here is to say that while through the next five days, the jet stream retreats north and is relatively weak across North America, there's nothing upstream or even immediately downstream in the Atlantic that says shut it down, lock it into place, and don't let things move for another 25 or 30 days. I do not see that. So what we do get out of that is over the next five days, well, with the ridge still in place, it's warm. And that warmth stretches from the southwest up into the Canadian prairies. We will get a little bit of break here in the Pacific Northwest because you saw that trough that was moving in there. But as this ridge kind of just occupies this area, we will eventually get flow that comes over it and, and keeps parts of the Mid-South, parts of the Eastern Corn Belt, parts of the South Central U.S. into the Delta with near average to even slightly cooler than average temperatures. And both models are in agreement about that. Going on out to the six to 10 day time period, this is where things do get a little uh, in less agreement. We're going to explain why in a few moments. Notice how much more aggressive the GFS is with bringing in cooler weather that's going to start in parts of Saskatchewan, stretch all the way over to Quebec, and really keep no normal temperatures here into the eastern Corn Belt. The European model has that same pattern, but it's farther north and wants to stretch for a time period here above average temperatures across much of the central plains going over toward the Great Lakes states and into the northeast. So the reason why these two forecasts are beginning to differ is let's just go out there to this upcoming uh, uh, Saturday. So the, excuse me, this is Saturday the 29th. And look, on the GFS side of things, much deeper trough. See it there? 
and it flattens out this ridge much more effectively in the western United States by digging in a much deeper trough into the west. So what does the European do, which is the warmer model? Well, it tucks this trough much farther back over just north of the Aleutian Islands, builds in a broader ridge into British Columbia. That gives us a less defined trough that comes into the western United States, a more robust ridge over the southwest, and that pushes the downstream trough further north. So it's, it's got a flatter pattern overall because of what it's doing with the upstream trough over the Aleutian Islands. So the end result is that warmer pattern coming out of the European model. Now, these differences may seem subtle, but I think we're going to have to watch to see which is, which is going to end up being correct. If I could make a comment about this, I would say that the GFS has trended more toward higher amplitudes. In other words, bigger troughs and bigger ridges. And at times it's been right. So we'll have to see if that is truly the case as we move forward into that day 10 time period. But as we see going all the way out now to September 2nd, so this is looking deep into week two, look at the differences in the models. GFS over here on the, on the left first, much broader trough now coming out of the Aleutian Islands. And then you can see the flow kind of breaking off into two pieces. But generally, we no longer see this, the huge ridge that's over the western United States. And now we start to see a bit of ridging down here over the southeast. So what this ends up doing is this ends up sending the flow pattern a bit farther to the north with troughs coming through the Canadian prairies. We tend to stay wetter north, okay? Whereas the European, which is over here on the right, all the way out to September 2nd, it wants to bring in a much more robust ridge that comes into British Columbia. But you notice to the south of it, it still has some ridging features here. In other words, no west coast trough. And then it just generally just sweeps this around and pulls it back out into the North Atlantic. Now this particular pattern is gonna keep the West dry and it's gonna keep so much of this part of the United States and the Canadian prairies with a much more active storm track. Let me show you what I mean. Over there on the left, you see how the GFS really wants to keep this corridor wetter. And of course, we'll talk more about the tropics in a few moments, but it tends to be drier as you get down toward the Gulf Coast. It doesn't mean we won't have daily thunderstorms down here because it's still gonna be humid and, and storms are gonna pop, but not necessarily the more organized precipitation we see to the north. The GFS, though, is considerably different from the ECMWF, which, look at this, it's just got a whole wide corridor here painted over to having a more stormy start to the month of September. So some significant model differences we're going to have to pay close attention to, and I hope that my explanation of the difference in that flow pattern helps you understand why those differences exist. But let's take this on out and talk temperatures as well. Remember, with the GFS and that broader trough, look at the broader sector of the United States here that's showing up cool. It's not that the European is um, not cooling things down a little bit, but with the ridge, much more established ridge in the west, that's why we tend to see warmer temperatures up the west coast and again, more precipitation downstream. So the higher amplitude pattern in the GFS is actually keeping things drier farther south. That's really what I was trying to illustrate with this particular setup. Now from there, I wanna show you the model output first and let's try to make some sense of it. We're gonna use our two major long range forecasting models uh, for the week three and week four time period. The CFS V2 is first. Now we've got two time periods, September 2nd through the 8th on the top and the 9th through the 16th on the bottom. And the maps on the left represent precipitation and on the right represent temperature. Now, when we look at both of these uh, animations, I'll tell you something about the precipitation patterns. I have yet to see a global model consistently pick up on a week three, week four precipitation pattern. So what we're gonna have to ask ourselves is, is there anything blocking up the pattern to shut down the precipitation? In other words, to turn it off, make it super hot and dry for a lot of people. At this point, when you look at this, I don't see that particular pattern setting up. The temperature discussion, in my opinion, is actually much more uh, of, a, of a discussion we should have and, and one I think we can make a little bit more of a case for. You can see that the models are continuing first week of September to wanting to build some heat west and also some heat along the east coast but allow the pattern to continue to bring in at times cooler shots of air out of the Canadian prairies and then into the central plains of the U.S. And then the CFS V2 goes after big time heat in the western United States for that second full week of the month of September. And downstream deep troughing here keeps things cooler. So what we ask is, is that same pattern reflected in the European? So take a quick snapshot of this 
And now let's go to the European model. Once again, the European model giving us more of a, a mixed bag, no real discernible signal in the precipitation here. I will go back and say that in that week three time period, see how the CFSB2 is wet there? So is the European during that time period. But look out here at week four. Uh, you, don't see, you don't see strong anomalies either way. Now, what's interesting is the week four European forecasts have consistently just put in warmth for everybody. They've really trended at the end of their model runs toward these warmer conditions. But you can see in the week three, notice the near average temperatures that likely do extend farther to the south and east inside that oval I just drew. So I'm picking up on some similarities, but maybe the warm bias in the ECMWF long range is continuing to show, to show up here uh, in this forecast. The unknown will be what happens in the western part of the United States. And I think the big unknown there is what's going on in the North Pacific with that warm blob of water. And does the MJO move? Does La Nina reinvigorate? Let's answer those questions as we work toward the end of this video. First things first, let's talk about La Nina. Ocean temperatures right now, as we've seen all summer long, we've confined our cooler water to this area, but it's not been able to expand nor really truly establish into a La Nina-like pattern. And that's certainly the case now as well. What do we got? Well, we've got our ocean temperatures trying to get down to this half degree Celsius mark below zero, right? So negative 0.5. And it bounces off of those numbers, but then it just bounces back up. Our Southern Oscillation Index is now firmly in the positive territory, which means the atmosphere is going more toward La Nina-like behavior. And this increase over the last couple of weeks, we shouldn't be ignoring. And the reason why is because we've now started to see with our models that they're forecasting more robust easterly winds than they were earlier this week. So what do I see here? Well, this is going from the 19th all the way through September the 3rd. And the map on the bottom is kind of the, 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 the projection of what you see on the top there. Now remember, where you see these blue colors, that would represent easterly winds. So what we're going to see in the near term is stronger easterly winds here that then with time spread back out into the open Pacific. So that's a good La Nina-like signature. These westerly winds over here are kind of shrinking a bit with time as well. And again, that would be, that would be good for La Nina. But I honestly think what's happening here is the weak La Nina is kind of playing along with the MJO. So what's the MJO doing? Well, it's not doing what it did last time, which was when it got over to phase one and two, stalling there. It's not. You can see that the latest forecasts want to keep bringing it on through to over to the Indian Ocean. So we're seeing the spread farther to the east of the good upper level uh, vertical motion which means the suppressing motion, which is here, is also moving in east, kind of in concert with this, as we work through the next 10 to 15 day time period. So this to me says we're not blocking up and shutting down like we did in July, uh, the, the, the tropics, they're, they're going to continue to move and the MGO looks as though it's going to continue to progress in its normal counterclockwise motion through its phase diagram. So let's think longer term because the models have continued to put out September, October, November, a more robust signature here for this La Nina. At least we see it in the ocean temperatures. Now, I've been very skeptical of this, but maybe some evidence is building. You saw it in the Southern Oscillation Index. And also, just to let you know, the Bureau of Meteorology out of Australia has been kind of touting that they think this particular La Nina is going to have, well, a bit of time to strengthen as we get into the fall months. And I'll tell you something, the bomb, as they're called, Bureau of Meteorology, they're very very good at what they do and I respect their research. So when they call for this to strengthen, I'm going to be paying attention. And this is why. You see, if we correlate those central uh, uh, Pacific Ocean temperatures with North American precipitation rate, what I want you to see is whenever we have a La Nina, this area tends to be wetter and we tend to be drier in through here. Now the wild card, let's put a big question mark on this, would be what comes out of this area? What comes out of the tropics? Because you could have a really dry start of September and going into October, but just one system could come up and completely ruin that. And there's no way today I could tell you what that's going to be. But I'll back this off here and I just want to show you again. If we do strengthen the La Nina with time, just needs to get down there just to be La Nina, that would be indicative of drier conditions inside of this wedge I'm drawing. And we can actually see that our longer range models for example, the European here wants to keep wetter here and just in general, a drier pattern in through this area. Now, we will honestly, as we work toward harvest, would definitely want this to be the case. And I'll tell you, it's not just the GF, or excuse me, the ECMDF that's saying that. 
This is the National Multimodal Ensembles. Eight separate models go into this. Look, wetter corridor, drier corridor. Question mark on the tropics. That's going to be the one that's going to be the most tricky to understand. So we can see some consistency here as we look out in toward the late summer and early fall time period. Now, in terms of temperatures, both models do want to keep warmer conditions in the western United States. The NMME does always look as though it has a very well-established warm bias to it. The ECMWF does as well, but I'm looking more for the pattern here. And I see that both models are really trying to keep that warmth farther to the west. That would follow long-term trends as well. But from there, what I want to show you is this. You see, our last two harvest time periods, October 18 and October 19 for the midsection of the country, have been very, very wet. What did they feature? Well, in October of 2018, if you remember back, we saw a frontal boundary that sat right here. It was a stationary boundary that got locked in between two pressure cells, high pressure here and generally higher pressure over the south, and the flow around it was coming like that, and this front didn't move. And as a result, we saw tremendously heavy rain stretching from Texas all the way to Wisconsin and major, major flooding along the way. In 2019, it was a different setup. There was a deep trough that cut into the northwestern part of the United States and the Canadian prairies, sending them over very cold as the air ran around this bigger ridge that parked just off the coast. This drew in a lot of moisture. and We had just repeated thunderstorms that raced through the eastern part of the United States. This particular year, at this point, these two scenarios are looking less likely. And that is the main story that I want to finish with today. These two particular setups from our last two Octobers are looking less likely to be the case as we look forward into this forecast. It's not set in stone. I'm going to continue to look at it every single week until we get to October. But this is my preliminary thoughts on how things are going to shape up. So thanks for giving me your time again today. Look forward to talking again in the morning. Have a good one. Thank you.